Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my biased theorems, very biased collection. What are my favorite theorems, of course, or what are my favorite subfields? Um, here's some that is quite dear to me, a certain type of subfield, which is not cryptography. Cryptography is not a subfield. Cryptography is big enough to not be called a subfield, but group-based cryptography. So it combines um, computer science, cryptography, and algebra, let's say, group theory, and what makes it this really, really great kind of combination of things. As far as I can tell, it's not all that successful in the sense of cryptography. So most standard cryptography protocols still run on elliptic curves, as far as I know, which is a little bit of an orthogonal direction. But um, from the point of view of algebra, I really like it, and it motivates some really nice a non-trivial type of algebra. This is what I'm going to uh, discuss today. So the whole the whole starting point of everything in modern cryptography is the Diffie-Hellman protocol or the Diffie-Hellman approach, which I'm going to recall um, on the next slide. But essentially, it should be the following: um, it relies on something, and this is always a catch. But anyway, but here's the idea. As probably one of the best pictures ever on Wikipedia that I stole, um, is how it works. So let's say you are there party A, party A is here on the left, and there's party B, and then there's party C. Party C is always the aggressor in my case, and they want to figure out the, um, well, the secret. So how could you communicate between A and B, a common secret, without doing something silly, like A locks it in a, in a box with a key, brings the key to B and brings the box to B. That, that's not a good way of doing it, right? So you want to do it somewhat online, uh, somewhat online, probably without having to have to send the key around or something. And this seems to be really difficult. It's not quite clear how that should work, but here comes a cool idea. And I really like this idea and it's very, very simple. And it's essentially the underlying idea of all of these modern public uh, key exchange protocols, cryptography protocols. So let's say there is something secret. You want to transfer a secret and we call it a secret color. So A has whatever this color is. Is it red? And B has whatever this color is. This type of a green type color. Blue? Green? I can't tell. Some type of color. So both have some type of color. And how can you, could you communicate this type of color without C knowing uh, that A wants to send red and B wants to send green? Um, sent, not set, wants to send it around. And so A should know, oh, I got green. And B should know, oh, I got red. Okay, or some common secret, something like that. And C should have no chance to get it. Sure, fine. Okay, how does it work? Well, there's something C's, C's uh, allowed to know. That's kind of the common paint. So you can make it public. We're using yellow. Well, fine. So what you do now is you mix um, yellow to your favorite to your secret. No? So yellow and red is something that's brownish color maybe. Yellow and green is this bluish color. Okay, and that's what you can send around. And this part is easy attackable by C. So C will see brown and blue. Right, but how do you get from brown and blue, um, how do you get now the common secret? Well, everyone now just mixes their own color to it and the common secret is then the common color. And in this case, whatever, this is dark brown or whatever. And C has no access to neither green nor red. And still A and B have a common secret. This relies somewhat on uh, that mixtures are hard to decompose. So C shouldn't be able to figure out that well, from, from orange. Let's call this orange. This is brown, this is orange, right? So let's agree on this is orange. So if you have, that makes more sense. Red and yellow is certainly orange, not brown. But anyway, so if you have this orange type color here, C shouldn't be able to figure out that it was made out of red and yellow. So there's some, 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 some problem in this approach. And the problem is that something should be difficult. But otherwise, it's kind of a really cool example. This is how you communicate um, a secret, a common secret, without ever going from uh, was out, let's say, A going to B and giving them a key, which is a little bit stupid, right? So this is how you can communicate a secret and make it hopefully 
difficult for C. And the Diffie-Hellman then works, well, maybe not with colors because that's not very practical. You still need to carry colors around, but it works something like this. You have uh, some G, which is a public element is invertible mod P. That's a, that's a multiplicative group mod P. And A fixes some A and B fixes some B. And you just send around G to the A and G to the B. G is public, but you, A would send G to the A and B would send G to the B. Yeah, and this is this is something C could ex could could access. Um, and how do you get the common secret then? Well, you can just multiply it out. So A computes the G to the B because G to the B is what you get to the A, well, which is just really just G to the B plus A, and the other one computes the, exactly the same, which turns out to be the same because this guy is then um, exactly the same. And I should have written times and not plus. My exponentiation really sucks. Uh, so let's get, let's just pretend I haven't done that. And let's just say this is times and this is times as well. And it still comes all right, whether you write it with plus or uh, with times. Doesn't matter. Wonderful. Anyway, um, ignore my exponentiation. So uh, just what happens here is that C only knows the prime, the prime can be public, that's fine. You know G, G is public, and you know the mixture, G to the A and G to the B. And you would need to find G to the A times B. And this is difficult. This is exactly this point where mixing color, uh, decomposing colors is difficult. So your secret is essentially um, kind of safe here, and the problem is that the algorithm to do that would be some kind of discrete logarithm, right? You want to get A and B from G to the A and G to the B. So some discrete logarithm, discrete here because the underlying group is this guy. And that seems to be difficult, unless you believe in quantum computing. And this is how um, your secret is relatively safe. Um, and the next step is, well, this is good, but it somehow relies on the hack that the discrete logarithm problem is difficult. So maybe it's somehow better to put the difficulty somewhere else. Some fun thing here about cryptography is, so everywhere else in mathematics, you are just happy if something is easy. In cryptography, you're really only happy if something is hard, right? Easy is bad for cryptography, hard is good. So you want to put the difficulty somewhere else and you don't want to rely on some fluke that something is difficult. So you want to have a more flexible thing and then maybe make it even more difficult for C to attack your problem. So the idea is essentially to replace Z mod P with a group which is already sufficiently complicated itself, right? So the group Z mod P is just super easy. Obviously, there's not much going on. <laughs> so it's not difficult. Uh, but if you make G sufficiently complicated, you could use already is a complication in the group. Yeah, you don't, don't need to disguise it. You don't need to use any hacks to make things difficult but because already the group is difficult. So that's kind of the idea of group-based cryptography. And then it's about finding a good group, essentially. And that's what it's supposed to be. So what, what type of groups are difficult? And it kind of gives a uh, kind of a nice upshot in algebra because you now have questions you would like to ask about groups. I will show you one in a second. So for example, you could just replace, in the, in the previous thing we had a g to the a, where a was a, some kind of integer and g was uh, an element in, in my group, which was z mod p. Yeah. And if you just replace this by this expression, the conjugacy, you can just make sense of this in any group. And you can run exactly the same type of protocol um, as before, really same game, different names. Well, just just the g to the x now means something different. And this really now kind of is much more interesting because now already the group can be made complicated and you still have this somewhat discrete logarithm thing going on, just in terms of slightly different terms, namely in terms of uh, conjugacy. And another upshot, if this really works, would be maybe you can even kind of tweak the algorithm uh, get away from the discrete logarithm and make something that is safe for quantum computers. 
Uh, still, if you believe in quantum computers, if you don't, then, <laughs> then maybe you're happy anyway. Anyway, so this should work for this works for any group. And then some of the question is, what are the good candidates? They're usually called protocol groups. So what groups are reasonably difficult to make a problem in them difficult? Right? So kind of a, it's kind of instead of relying on hold as this brilliant idea that a discrete logarithm problem is difficult, you kind of um, have some more of a general approach. That you just throw in a difficult group and you already have a measure what makes a deep group difficult and you will be safe. That's kind of the, the idea. So people have proposed, for example, break groups, but they are actually not, not all that great. But some some difficult group, right? So that's what you want. So then not Z mod P, Z mod P is too easy, some more um, difficult group and essentially group-based cryptography studies what makes a group good for those uh, type of purposes. And one of the kind of the, the big meta theorems is the linear attack. And whatever that means, it means that if a certain group representation is small, then its group is probably not so good. So it's a measurement for goodness. Um, whatever, nice, there's some nice representation and representation really just means you send the group into the realm of linear algebra, right? You send the group to an action on a vector space and then you can essentially use um, tools from linear algebra to decrypt, right? For, for as an attacker, you could then use um, tools from linear algebra. And linear algebra is just too powerful. It's just too good. It's just will break everything. It just makes, bah, bush, just breaks everything. And that's kind of the point. So if a group is like too effectively presented on a linear space so that you can l use linear algebra, any type of protocol you would run in a group, like a generalization of this Diffie-Hellman, like for example, this type of thing, the conjugacy problem, will fall apart because of there are so many good algorithms in linear algebra. That's kind of the idea. And group-based cryptography tries to answer similar questions, put some measurement of complexity on a group, uh, play around with the problem. I really was only talking about the conjugacy problem here. In this video maybe you can adjust the problem a little bit and if you're really lucky then you hit something that is difficult even in linear algebra i don't know any good example of that usually problems are really easy in linear algebra and this linear attack is just uh, usually a death sentence death death sentence for for a group that's kind of where um kind of the group-based cryptography comes in and the reason why group-based cryptography is not all that fantastic is kind of that this meta theorem kills a lot of possible groups because a lot of groups actually surprisingly they're non-linear objects have very efficient presentations on linear spaces you know, very efficient presentations on vector spaces so essentially the the field is evolving at this point and the name is not quite suitable anymore maybe maybe you want to replace group by something else because a lot of groups are actually really easy presentable uh, in the realm in the term in terms of linear algebra so linear equals bad that's what i what i told you again keep in mind that in cryptography something that is difficult is good right linear algebra is easy so linear is bad yeah, just keep that in mind but anyway more linear structure is better for c so some of kind of modern interpretations of group-based cryptography try to avoid linear structure as much as possible you might want to look at monoids instead of groups, so no inverses, uh, semi-groups instead of groups, or even non-associative things instead of instead of groups, right? Because they are supposed to be more difficult to represent in uh, terms of linear algebra. Uh, another big thing, another big uh, branch of group-based cryptography is to work over semi-rings, like the tropicals or something, because they are again tropical tropical linear algebra in contrast to usual linear algebra is just shit the algorithms are really bad you won't get anywhere and uh, there is almost no way to represent it nicely on a classical linear space right? so that's again linear is bad these things are really difficult to represent on a linear space that's excellent for uh, this type of cryptography anyway i hope you enjoyed this video and i also hope to see you next time